So in this third and final section of the week four lecture, I'm going to talk about non-parametric versions of the test for comparing groups, um, and also look at versions of tests which can compare more than two groups at once, both parametric and non-parametric. But first, a reminder of what non-parametric tests are. These are useful if we don't want or can't make assumptions about our variables distribution. And in particular, if the data aren't normally distributed, then t-tests won't work for us. Remember, a t-test is used for comparing means. And if we don't have normally distributed data, this might not be a sensible thing to do in any case, because if we've got a highly skewed variable, then looking at the mean doesn't necessarily give us a good indication of the overall location or distribution of that variable. So instead, what the non-parametric tests do will either compare the median or compare the ranks of the data. Now, just a little word about SPSS and non-parametric tests, and you'll see this in the uh, practical tutorial part of today's session. There are two ways of conducting non-parametric versions, sorry, non-parametric tests in SPSS. There is sort of an automatic chooser of your test based on the information you give to SPSS. There are also what it calls legacy dialogues, legacy versions of the tests, which are where you specify the test you want. Now, when I talked about doing graphs in SPSS, I recommended you use the legacy versions of the graphs. And in some ways, I would recommend the same for the non-parametric tests. However, there are some advantages to using the automatic versions of the test um, that SPSS offers. And I'll mention these to you as we go through. But first, let's consider the non-parametric version of the independent samples t-test. And that non-parametric version is called the Mann-Whitney U-test. And what this does, rather than comparing the original values of the variables, it ranks the original data. So if we're looking at people's height, it won't look at the actual values of the height, it will look at where someone is compared with everyone else as a ranking in the data set. And effectively what this does is it ranks all of the original data and then compares the ranks in one group with the ranks in the other group. And it actually tests the hypothesis that the mean rank is the same. Now, what we see in the output here are two different tests of the same hypothesis, the null hypothesis that the distribution of the pain score at three months is the same between the two groups, the treatment group, which is in the clinic group, and the home or control group. Now, on the left-hand side, what we get is the output from the automatic version of the test. And this gives us a clear statement of what the null hypothesis is. It tells us what type of test has been used, gives us the p-value, and tells us what, that what the decision based on the p-value would be. In this case, it is to retain the null hypothesis. There's no evidence from the p-value of 0.123 that we should reject the null hypothesis. On the right-hand side, we get the output from the legacy dialogues part of the study, uh, part of the uh, test, version of the test, I should say, sorry. Um, here we get the same information. Um, in particular, at the bottom, we see that the p-value here, 0.123, is the same. It doesn't give us the decision, but we should be able to detect that for ourselves. And actually, by default, we get considerably more information. Uh, we get the various test statistics, and we get the number in each group. We get the mean rank of each group. We can see that for the clinic group, the mean rank is 93.6. For the home group, 
it's 105.7. So we get some measure of the size of the difference between the groups, even though it's not significant in this case. Now, you might think from this that the legacy version is more useful, and in some ways I think it is. However, um, what we don't see from this is if we want more information about the hypothesis test from the um, table on the left, the one from the automatic version of the test, we can actually double click on that and get more information which underlies this. It's not immediately obvious, uh, but we'll see a bit more on that in the SPSS practical. But in this case, either way, we would come to the same conclusion that we have no reason to reject the null hypothesis that the rankings are the same in the two groups. Now, if we have not independent samples, but paired data, so the equivalent of the paired samples t-test, we also have a version of the non-parametric test for this. This is called the Wilcoxon signed rank test. And what this does is it compares the ranks of differences. The differences between the two different observations that we are looking at. And the null hypothesis is that positive and negative changes are equally spread out. So in this case, what we might look at is whether the pain scores at baseline and 12 months show a consistent increase or decrease. Effectively, what we're doing to here is testing whether there are equal numbers of increases and decreases. And from the output here, again, we've got the two different versions of it. Either way, we see that the p-value is 0.004. So the decision would be to reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis here being that pain levels are the same at baseline and at 12 months. And in fact, if we look at the uh, right hand side here, we can see that if we look at the Lick at 12 minus lick at 0, which means the pain score at 12 months minus the pain score at baseline, then we have slightly more negative ranks than positive ranks, suggesting that the pain score is generally uh, a little bit lower at 12 months than at 0 months. That information we don't get immediately from the test on the left, but Again, by double-clicking on that, we can go and find out further information. The key thing, though, is that the p-value is the same either way. And the other thing to say about these non-parametric tests is we don't get a simple version of the effect size that we might get in the parametric tests. So whereas we can easily look at the difference between group means in the parametric version, here there's no such obvious statistic. We can look at the mean ranks instead, but it's not so intrinsically meaningful. Now for the final part, let's look at situations where we have more than two groups. First of all, the parametric versions. So if we've got more than two groups and we want to compare the means of the groups, we can call upon the one-way analysis of variance, which is usually shortened to ANOVA, where you can see where those letters come from via analysis of variance. There is a non-parametric version of this, which is called the Crystal wallace test. I'll talk about that in a few moments, um, but I'll start off by talking about the parametric version. Um, and if we're talking about extensions of paired samples, that's not something we'll cover today, but something we'll cover much later in the module. Now, the one-way ANOVA uses the same assumptions as the independent samples t-test, so that the uh, distribution in each group is normally distributed 
and that the variance in each group is the same. And we can also use Levine's test for the homogeneity of variances here. So this would test the null hypothesis that the variance in each group is the same. But then the one-way ANOVA itself compares the variance there is between groups with the variance within groups, so-called residual variance. And it tests the null hypothesis that the means of all groups are equal. So here, what we're looking at is a test of um, what the mean birth weight is from three different groups, um, the groups defined by the race of the mother. So we've got three uh, groups, white, black, and other. And what we can see from the upper table here, the table at the top, uh, is, are the descriptive statistics for each of the three groups separately. So we can see that the mean birth weight of babies is just over 3,100 grams for white mothers. It's 2,719 for black mothers and just over 2,800 for other uh, racial groups. We, first of all, would look to see whether the variance in the three groups is the same. So we get this test of homogene homogeneity of variances via the Levine test. And here we see that the p-value 0.647 shows there is no reason to reject the null hypothesis that the variances are equal in the three groups. And then we get the actual test itself, the ANOVA. Now we get a lot of information here a lot of numbers, a lot of which might not be particularly meaningful to us. But the key thing here is that the p-value on the right-hand side, 0 0.008, tells us that we can reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis here would be that the mean birth weight in the three groups is the same. So we can reject that. However, that might not be really all we want to know, because all we know now is that the mean birth weight isn't the same. It doesn't tell us which groups are different from each other. This is where post hoc tests come in. Post hoc tests are used to test which groups are statistically from, different from each other. Um, and they're called post hoc tests because we do it after the main test. We only do the post hoc tests if the null hypothesis is rejected. And it tests each pair of differences in turn. Now, because this results in lots of different tests, there is actually quite a high probability of getting a type 1 error. So in other words, finding a significant result when actually the null hypothesis is true. Therefore, we need to apply a correction for this. And one version of the correction is called the Bonferroni correction. And this is what uh, I often recommend people to use in SPSS because it applies it automatically whilst doing these tests. Let's look at an example. This is the output from the post hoc Bonferroni tests for the situation we looked at before. And what it does is it compares each pair of groups in turn. So in the first row here, we're comparing white mothers with black mothers. We get a mean, mean difference here of 384 grams, p-value of 0 0.048, and that is the corrected p-value, meaning that this is just below the 0 0.05 level, and we would re reject the null hypothesis that the mean weight of white and black mothers is the same. Sorry, the mean weight of the babies born to wh white and black mothers is the same. Likewise, we would see the difference between white mothers and mothers from other racial groups. The mean difference is just under 300 grams. The p-value, 0 0.027. So again, we would reject the null hypothesis that they are 
the same weight of babies. And we get a confidence interval for each of those differences. We can see the confidence intervals are fairly wide, but they don't include zero, which supports the p-value being below 0 0.05. Now there's actually only other one pair of differences we've not looked at there, which is the difference between black mothers and mothers from other racial groups. We get each one repeated twice, so we see that the 384 gram difference between white and black mothers is the same effectively as the minus 384 gram difference between the weight of babies born to black and white mothers. But the only other one we need to look at is the difference between black mothers and other mothers, and we see that the difference in baby weights there is minus 84 grams. So that's quite a small difference, and the p-value, well, it's shown as 1, which means after the correction is applied, there's absolutely no evidence at all that we should reject the null hypothesis that babies born to black mothers are um, the same weight as babies born to mothers of other groups. So in this case, we would conclude that there is evidence that babies born to white mothers are heavier than those born to either of the other groups, but that there is no evidence to suggest that the weight of babies born to black mothers are any different from the weight of the babies born to mothers from the other racial groups. The non-parametric equivalent of this one-way ANOVA is called the kruskal wallis test. And it's a direct extension of the Mann-Whitney test, so it compares the sums of ranks. There isn't a direct equivalent of the post hoc tests, so what we have to do instead is a series of individual Mann-Whitney tests. And this is where actually the automatic version comes in very useful. Because we see, if we look at the same data, but using the kruskal wallis test, that the significance, the p-value here, 0 0.014, would lead us to reject the null hypothesis, which we would probably expect, given that's what we found in the parametric version of the test. Now, on the right-hand side, we get the mean rank in each group, and we get the p-value, but we get nothing at all about the differences between each pair of groups. On the left-hand side, in the automatic version of the test, if we were to double-click on this, we would find that these post-hoc tests are actually done using a series of Mann-Whitney tests. It can be a bit tricky to find that if you don't know where to look, so we will cover that in the practical part of today's session. So that's all the different procedures I wanted to cover today. Essentially, we've got anything for comparing two groups, either parametric or non-parametric, which are the independent samples and the um, Mann-Whitney U-test. If we've got paired data, we can use the paired samples T-test or the Wilcoxon signed rank test. Or if we've got more than two groups, for independent groups, not paired data. We can use either the one-way ANOVA or uh, the non-parametric equi equivalent, which would be the kruskal wallis test. You can read more about all of these in chapter eight of the Campbell as